So today, uh, we're talking about the 11 reasons you need to break up with dieting and what to do instead. Why? Why are we talking about this? This is the time of year when I see a lot of things start to circulate around like new year, new you, and you know, this kind of, um, uh, this kind of messaging that if you would only get smaller, life would be so much better for you. And it's crap. It's such crap. It's such unbelievable crap. And so I wanted to um, come on, be the straight shooter. These are the 11 reasons that I literally just came up with over my morning coffee. I'm sure if you asked me, I could come come up with about 38 more, but I didn't want to waste your time. I wanted to get really uh, focused and really clear. So these are top of mind 11 reasons why you should break up with dieting. I don't love shoulds, but in this case, I might put I might throw a should down. Uh, and what to do instead. All right, so you ready? Number one, I have to keep track because I would lose my place if I didn't write these down. Number one, dieting isn't sustainable. And you know from your own experience, and m most of the people that come to me know from their own experience that eating in a restrictive way does not set you up for a lifetime of habits. So researchers at UCLA published an article in the Journal of the American Psychological Association. And here's a quote from that article. People on diets typically lose five to 10% of their starting weight in the first six months, the researchers found. However, at least one third to two thirds of people on diets regain more weight than they lost within four or five years. And the true number may well be significantly higher, researchers said. So for the last 10 years, I have been begging people to break up with the diet uh, and exercise industry. And by exercise, just so you know, I'm a big fan of exercise, but it's the exercise that's that excessive exercise that you need to be doing it all the time in order to you know, reach XYZ goal or doing exercise because you want tight abs or you know buns of steel or whatever that stuff is repulsive and that is what i'm talking about so in the last couple of months i've had people enter the whole moon wellness formula from noom from weight watchers all feeling really low so this is why dieting is not sustainable number two deprivation messes with your head it really does. It's, it messes with your head. It certainly messed with mine when I was deep in the, the diet cycle. And here's where it messes with your head. It messes with your head in terms of the failing and starting cycle of dieting. The, um, you know, you start, it's not sustainable and you fail and therefore you, um, that messes with your head. Second, Lee, that all or nothing thinking of dieting, that um, the cycle sets up that perfectionism and meeting these really high standards and not being able to meet these high standards, that really messes with your head, let alone just deprivation. And it starts up a food cycle in your neurological system that really starts to change food for people. <clears throat> Number three. Very rarely do these systems ever take into play your intrinsic reasons for wanting to participate in them. On the whole, they tend to play with the surface level or extrinsic reasons for why you may want to lose weight. Extrinsic is outside of you. So that is um, a number on a scale, that is the size of your pants, that is, it's all outside of you. I believe in body autonomy and I believe in a person's right to choose, excuse me, <coughs> to lose weight if they so choose, that is their choice. I just beg them to start looking at it from the intrinsic reasons why you might want to do that. Reasons of value that are inside, um, that come from you know, where, wherever, within, energy, lowering your high blood pressure, being able to run around with your grandkids, whatever it is, have it be from an internal reason instead of an external reason. 
It's more meaningful. And therefore, your goals are more tangible and more lasting. Number four, got to write it down. Always wanting something outside of yourself. You're always left wanting. This was certainly the case for me, is that you would reach the goal and you would weirdly not be satisfied because you're not really addressing what the issue is. For everybody, that issue is different. For me, it was about worthiness. It was about <clears throat> not want, and, and perfectionism for sure. But you get there and because you haven't addressed the real issues, you end up kind of feeling not great. You end up not feeling like, woohoo, I've arrived, which is really another thing that the diet industry says is, is there's a, an arrival point. And that's not how wellness works. It's, it's a lifetime journey. But it doesn't address that, that thing. And so you may reach your goal, but you're still left wanting. Number five, the diet and exercise industry is set up for you to fail. The bar is set so high um, and it's so difficult to adhere to whatever the restrictions or requirements are of said diet that you invariably fail according to their standards. And that's great for them because that means you're constantly in the cycle uh, and constantly paying and constantly feeling less than in some way. My hope is that once people see me, they never see me again, you know, that they learn lifetime tools that they can take with them and practice for life. But that's not how the diet and exercise industry is set up. It's set up for you to constantly be engaged in and paying money to. Number six. This is the heart of my work is it separates you from sensing and feeling. So when you take a somatic approach to eating, which is about sensing and feeling, um, what happens is, is when you, when you restrict or, or try to diet, you override sensing and feeling or your deep knowing about, oh, I'm starting to get hungry or I'm starting to feel like I have, I'm having an emotional eating attack, or I'm starting to feel full. It breaks you from sensing and feeling. And therefore, number seven, it separates you from trusting yourself. Diet, the diet and exercise industry separates you from your deep trust of self. So you can't trust yourself around food. Food, it's most people, they just don't trust themselves. And there's something they don't know. I don't understand what's wrong with me. Um, and then they turn into this kind of being good versus being bad scenario. Oh, I've been good or I've been bad. So there's an, they put an emotional value on eating and that's giving food a great deal of power. Number eight, it does not address, most programs do not address the emotional eating response. Um, and because we all have that response, it needs to be addressed. And you need to learn tools in order to contend with it and to feel your feelings and to sit in discomfort sometimes and to be resilient in the face of it. I think there's a lot to, to dig into there that most diets just don't address at all. Number eight, it separates you from ever being satisfied or content in your skin. And that's the work. The work is, can I be cool with what I got going on here? Can I, can I be cool with what I have going on here despite whatever changes happen? Because the body changes, the body changes all the time. Within the, within the course of a day, the body changes. And, and also how you look at your body changes throughout the course of a day. And so it just kind of makes things, you're just never content. You're just, you're just constantly left feeling dissatisfied in your skin. Or even worse, into self-loathing. <clears throat> Number 10. 
it sets you up to feel like a failure, which we touched on before, but I want to be really clear about it, that when that bar is set, how you absorb it is I'm a failure. And that is such a bummer. There's no, in this framework, there's no middle ground. It's all or nothing. And so like you eat, you know, if you eat clean throughout the day and you decide to have cream in your coffee as an example, you're screwed for the day. That's how it's set up. Instead of there being spaciousness and um, gray in the middle. I think that's crappy for you to constantly feel like you're failing something instead of what did I do well? Um, what did I learn from this? What can I take forward from this? This is the, this, these are the questions to ask instead of berating ourselves for not, for not hitting the bar. Number 11, from a social justice perspective, current body standards, particularly in the West, are Eurocentric. That means they're focusing on white, cisgendered, able-bodied, and current body standards are steeped in capitalism. I am not a social justice educator. I'm informed by many social justice educators and I urge you to learn uh, from them, pay them by their books. And the three that I recommend are Sonia Renee Taylor, Rachel Ricketts, and Decolonizing Fitness. So back to the article. So when the researchers were asked, would people have been better off to not go on a diet at all? They said, we concluded most of the participants would have been better off not going on a diet at all. Their weight would pretty much be the same and their bodies would not suffer the wear and tear from losing weight and gaining it all back. So then the journal asked, what would you do instead? The researchers responded, eating in moderation is a good idea for everybody and so is regular exercise. It isn't sexy. It certainly isn't instant. And we all know it. It's the truth. It's the truth of it all. And that is what we're going to talk about next week. We're going to talk about, about pulling apart this thing and how can we approach it uh, in a way that makes sense for us. Let me know how this landed with you. Super glad that you joined me today. Have a great day. See ya.